room care. We'll hear from emergency medicine doctors and from the Health and Human Services Department and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. It's just over two hours. Today's hearing is regarding access to emergency care. Without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other committee member who seeks recognition. I would remind the committee members that uh, it, uh, we are, it's anticipated that we will um, be out of here by 12 o'clock, so we're going to stick straightly, strictly to our, our rules. And with that, uh, um, I want to thank all of you for being here. And today, we will examine the response of the Department of Health and Human Services to the, emer the nation's emergency care crisis. In times of tragedy, Americans rely on our emergency care system, whether because of a car wreck, a heart attack, stroke, or a pregnancy complication. Americans and their families show up at the doorstep of our nation's emergency rooms seeking critical care every day. Emergency care is the great equalizer. It is the only form of health care guaranteed to every American, regardless of his or her ability to pay. But in this way, it also provides a chilling snapshot of what is wrong with our nation's health care system. We all want emergency care to work effectively for ourselves and for our loved ones. When it does work, and it usually does, by the way, lives are saved. Lifelong disability is avoided. The many dedicated men and women who staff our nation's ERs, trauma centers, and ambulance services deserve our appreciation and our support. But when the system fails, it can have fatal consequences. Earlier this week, USA Today carried a front page story on the health crisis in Houston, where ERs divert ambulances 20 percent of the time. One doctor described the patient who died after being diverted from a Houston area hospital to one in Austin, 1,600 miles away, and I quote, he said, diversion kills you. In my hometown of Baltimore, a city health department study documented that between 2002 and 2005, the total hours city hospitals were on red alert status meaning that they had no cardiac monitored beds for arriving ER patients, increased by 36 percent. The length of time it took ambulances, ambulances to over, uh, offload patients in the ER increased by 45 percent, and the number of hours ambulances were diverted from overcrowded ERs shot up by 165 percent. Unfortunately, the emergency care crisis is not limited to Houston and certainly not limited to Baltimore. Failures in the ER have led to an increase in preventable death from, from treatable conditions like heart disease. An article in this morning's edition of USA Today indicates that seven of our nation's hospitals have worse heart attack death rates than the national average, while 35 have higher death rates for heart failure. The LA Times reported this past May that a 40-year-old woman collapsed on the waiting room floor of the ER at Martin Luther King Harbor Hospital in Los Angeles, while janitorial staff literally mopped the floor around her. Overburdened staff ignored her pleas for help, and her boyfriend, desperate for assistance, dialed 911 from the hospital. He was told to find a nearby nurse. His girlfriend died 45 minutes later. Last month, Newsweek.com described the fiscal challenges facing Grady Memorial Hospital in Atlanta. Grady Hospital supports one of the busiest ERs in, in the state and the only level one trauma center in a metropolitan area of 5 million people. But on any given day, it is not unusual for eight Atlanta hospitals to be diverting patients at the same time 
what will Atlanta do if Grady closes its ER? <clears throat> Even here in the District of Columbia, it is not unusual for ambulances to be parked seven deep in front of one or more of the city's bigger ERs waiting to offload patients. Not to be too blunt, but these are the same ERs that members of Congress and our families would turn to in an emergency. The fact of the matter is that we have a crisis in emergency care, and it is nationwide. This begs the question, with a national emergency and trauma care system as fragile as ours, how would we manage the very real threats of terrorist bombing, a natural disaster, or an outbreak of pandemic flu? Where is the surge capacity? The emergency room crisis is nothing new. More than five years ago, US, U.S. News and World Report published a cover story entitled Crisis in the ER. Turnaways and delays are a recipe for disaster. A copy is displayed on the easel before me. If you look closely, you will note, ironically, that the issue was published on September 10th, 2001. Five weeks after September 11th, Chairman Waxman released a report detailing the national problem of ambulance diversions and the shortage of emergency care. His report identified over 20 states in which hospitals were turning away ambulances because of overcrowding and funding shortfalls. Subsequent reports reached similar conclusions. A 2003 report by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found that ER rooms in U.S. hospitals diverted more than 1,300 patients a day. 1,300 patients a day, 365 days per year. 2003 GAO report documented ER crowding uh, throughout the country. And one year ago, the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences released a three-volume report on emergency care in the United States health system. This landmark study concluded that our nation's emergency and trauma care system is at the breaking point. Last summer, Congress enacted the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act. This act assigned responsibility for leading all federal, federal public health and medical responses to public health emergencies to the Department of Health and Human Services. But despite this clear responsibility and despite the billions of taxpayer dollars that Congress has appropriated for bio, defense, and pandemic preparedness, HHS prepare, appears to be ignoring the mounting emergency care crisis. The Department has not made a serious effort to identify the scope of the problem which communities are most affected. It has failed to require hospitals that participate in Medicare to report data on the extent of ER boarding and ambulance diversion. It has failed to use its purchasing power through the Medicare program to encourage hospitals to properly admit ill and injured patients to inpatient units rather than boarding them in ER hallways and forcing staff to divert inbound ambulances. It has done nothing to promote regionalization of highly specialized trauma and emergency care services, a key recommendation of the IOM report. Worse yet, the Department has recently taken some actions that will make matters worse. It is disputed, undisputed that part of the emergency care crisis is the result of the historic underfunding of safety net hospitals many of which serve as cornerstones of trauma and emergency care systems in their communities. However, rather than asking Congress for additional resources to assist these hospitals, the Department has attempted to bypass Congress by issuing rules that would cut hundreds of millions of dollars in supplemental Medicaid funding from these facilities. Ladies and gentlemen, this simply makes no sense. Last month, the Congress enacted a one-year moratorium that blocks the Department from implementing these funding reductions, but HHS has shown no signs of modifying its position. Today, we will hear from leading private sector experts on the emergency care, trauma care, and ambulance services. They will describe the emergency care crisis from the front lines. We will also hear from representatives of two agencies with HHS that have a particularly important role to play in addressing the crisis. The Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response and the National Institutes of Health. I hope that the testimony we hear today will help provide our committee with an understanding of the emergency care crisis that confronts us all. 
Nearly six years have passed since the wake-up call of September 11th, and HHS has yet to tackle this problem. The time for action is long overdue. And with that, I yield to the distinguished ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Davis. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to thank Chairman Waxman for uh, initiating this hearing. It's a very timely issue. We all know the value of a functioning emergency room. Millions of lives are saved annually only because emergency care is available. But across America, it's critical ser care services that are in critical condition. Last year, a study by the Institute of Medicine, the IOM, included our hospital-based emergency medical system was at the breaking point. Emergency rooms are finding it impossible to meet growing and competing demands for trauma care, mandated safety net care for the uninsured, public health surveillance, and disaster readiness. The IOM panel found emergency care capacity suffering from an epidemic of crowding, with patients parked or boarding in hallways, waiting to be admitted. Ambulances were routinely diverted to more distant facilities. While demand for EMS facilities grow, the number of facilities shrinks, and those still open find it increasingly difficult to retain on-call specialists and meet standards for timely care. The inevitable tragic result, preventable deaths as critically ill patients literally die from neglect in hallways in an ambulance bays waiting for the life-saving help that never comes. The simple truth is emergency care can and it should be better. But it's the legal, financial and demographic trends have converged to punish the success of hospital emergency departments <clears throat> transformed by federal law into the de facto primary care provider for millions of under and uninsured Americans. That unfunded mandate <clears throat> creates powerful incentives to close emergency rooms or limited missions so the capacity to perform elective, fully re reimbursed procedures will not be reduced. Low reimbursement rates and high malpractice premiums also work to keep needed specialists, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, and pediatricians, among others, from taking emergency and trauma patients. The anemic state of emergency medical services means most hospitals are already operating at or near capacity every day. A highway crash involving multiple casualties can overwhelm not just one, but all nearby hospitals because no one has information about the real-time availability of emergency beds in the region. Such a fragile, fragmented system holds virtually no surge capacity in the event of a natural disaster or terrorist attack. This committee has held several hearings on pandemic planning and preparedness. A constant concern that emerged from those hearings was the lack of surge capacity in our nation's hospitals. We've made great strides in homeland security since 9-11, but our public health infrastructure, particularly emergency medical response capacity, is still not ready for prime time. When the influenza pandemic erupts, as many predict it will, more than half a million Americans could die and over two million could need to be hospitalized. Any, in any large-scale public health crisis, emergency rooms should be overwhelmed, and they would be overwhelmed, by the genuinely sick hidden with waves that worried well. The growing crisis in emergency room compels us to ask, how do we plan to move from the current inadequate emergency care structure to the coordinated, regionalized, scalable and transparent system that we know that we need? What is the federal role in building and sustaining affordable and efficient medical services? How can we link emergency care capacity into a national response network to meet the full range of critical care demands from the predictable to a pandemic? I look forward to a discussion with our witnesses today on these difficult questions. I'm especially pleased to welcome Dr. Robert O'Connor, Professor and Chairman of the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Virginia. He is widely regarded as one of our nation's leading EMS physicians, and we're very grateful for his time and his insights as we explore these urgent issues. Thank you. I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Davis. It's my understanding that Ms. Uh, Watson has an opening statement. Ms. Watson, you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for uh, holding today's hearing. It's so relevant to constituents in my district in Los Angeles, the 33rd uh, district. Uh, we're going through a very serious crisis in our emergency uh, care system. A functional emergency and trauma care system is important for all communities to deal with and respond to disasters. And we must remember that these emergency care centers are not only for those patients who use them on a day-to-day -day basis, but they are what our nation will rely on if a natural disaster or terrorist attack occurs. This sector of the healthcare system 
is one of the most important aspects of our homeland security. As pointed out in the majority memo on uh, May 9, 2007, you heard about the 40-year-old woman who collapsed on the waiting room floor uh, at Martin Luther King Hospital, and uh, her pleas for help were ignored, and she died 45 minutes later. This hospital saved, uh, serves a major portion of my constituency who have no insurance and who do not have access to any other means of health care. And this incident was not the only one reported at the former King Drew Hospital, and definitely not the only occurrence in many emergency rooms across the nation. What are we showing the world by letting our citizens die in emergency rooms in the wealthiest nation in the world. The three federal departments, DOT, DHS, and HHS, that are responsible for the oversight of emergency and trauma care must start working together to make the system work better. And I'm sure there is a long list of oversight errors and omissions that point to the core of many of the problems we're discussing today. And I hope that by addressing this issue, uh, it is not too little and not too late. Hospital in our nation's urban areas have been plagued for years. They have been underfunded for so long that they cannot attract the type of doctors and nurses they need to run a high quality hospital. <coughs> and in turn, due to poor reputation, you limit the number of talented healthcare professionals you attract creating a downward spiral. Mr. Chairman, having hospitals such as King Harbor in my community, even in the condition it is in, is better than not having a hospital at all. The risk of getting inadequate health care is outweighed by the potential loss from having uh, to drive an extra 20 minutes to get care at any other hospital leading to overcrowding at those other hospitals. So I'm looking forward to hearing from the witnesses, and I hope that we can uh, get some answers so that we can remove the many risks that uh, accrue to our public. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Uh, what we will do now without objection is we will recess because we have two votes. Uh, we are. We have about five minutes left for the first vote, and then we'll. Then another vote will come immediately thereafter. I anticipate that we should be back here at quarter of, um, quarter of the hour, and until then we will recess. Thank you, witnesses, for uh, being patient with us. We will move this along as uh, fast as we can. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you all for waiting. The, uh, we'll resume the hearing now. The uh, committee will now receive testimony from the witnesses before us today. Our first panel consists of three distinguished experts in emergency trauma care. Dr. William Suave is Professor in Chief of the Division of Trauma and Surgical Critical Care at the University of Pennsylvania Medical Center in Philadelphia. Dr. Ray Johnson is Associate Director of the Department of Emergency Medicine, Mission Hospital Regional Medical Center and Director of Pediatric Emergency Medicine, Children's Hospital at Mission. 
and Dr. Bob O'Connor is Professor and Chairman, Department of Emergency Medicine, University of Virginia, Charlottesville. Gentlemen, would you please stand to be sworn in? Raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. I thank you very much. I just remind you that we have your um, statements, uh, your written statements, and we would just ask you to summarize within five minutes if you can. And then we'll have questions. Dr. Swap. Thank you, Congressman. I think rather than try to summarize, what I might do is start with a start with a bit of a story. Since it's a relatively recent story and it's uh, something that's very pertinent to the IOM report, uh, I sat for two and a half years as one of the 40 members of the IOM Commission and spent a considerable amount of time actually deliberating, analyzing, and trying to come up with solutions, both tactical and strategic, to look at this crisis in emergency care. But perhaps this story, more than anything, will make it real for you. Just two days ago, <clears throat> I was not on call for emergency. There's a group of nine of us at the University of Pennsylvania, surgeons that do all the emergency surgery and all the trauma care. We're a level one trauma center. We are one of the safety net hospitals, and we are one of the hospitals that in a disaster for the greater Philadelphia area and for a population of about 15 million people, we would go into action. 2.30 in the afternoon, just a normal day, I had a call from my fourth partner, not on call, to go to the emergency department to run a fifth room. I walked down to the emergency department and walked through our unit, and in that emergency department, there were people everywhere on stretchers. There were patients in chairs. The emergency physicians, our strongest colleagues and friends, were administering to people. And this wasn't a mass disaster. This was a fairly typical day with the exception that we had just been notified that, in fact, on Route 95, there was a significant crash probably a few mortally wounded and other people being brought in by helicopter and by ambulance. I went into our trauma center, very similar to that in Nashville or that in Baltimore, and I responded to what is a three-bed unit, had five people in it, two people on stretchers that were side by side with other people. And as we started to take care of these patients coming in from this terrible wreck and this collision, we had 30 seconds warning that the Philadelphia fire department was bringing in yet another person, and that was a trauma code. And it was a young man that had received a gunshot wound. And in the middle of that mayhem, I opened his chest and I started to pump his heart and I tried to resuscitate him. Now that's all part of our life in this business, but what's interesting is I looked up and I recognized that I was doing that and 40 feet away from me, watching me, were those people brought in for routine care and other emergencies. What was most interesting about this is you might say that's just Philadelphia. It's a big city and it's like any other city, Los Angeles or Washington, Atlanta. But that morning I'd been on the phone thanking someone at Strong Memorial Hospital in Rochester, New York, because last week my brother-in-law, 63-year-old retired teacher, an all-American football player in his prime who had lost his kidneys a few years ago to a terrible infection and a renal dialysis patient for years, just been transplanted, was home, became ill, went back to Strong Memorial, and could not be admitted because the ED had 40 or 50 people waiting to be admitted in upstate New York where I grew up in beautiful downtown Rochester. I couldn't believe it. But having spent two and a half years on the IOM and trying to find solutions for this government and for us to take on emergency, you have to believe it. It is universal. It is a terrible problem. It is a hidden problem. It has been swept underneath the rug continuously, and it may be being swept under the rug because people believe that there is no good way to solve it and the only way to solve it is throw money on it. And I would tell you the IOM did not conclude that, and our recommendations came after some thousands of hours of deliberation and looking at things. I have to also tell you that as I walked through the emergency department, I saw teams of specialists down there, cardiology, 
neurology. But the one that really frightened me was I saw infectious disease, and a friend of mine in the infectious disease department is a virologist, virus expert. And I finished with the emergency thoracotomy, and I was walking out to do my paperwork. And I thought, of all the things I'm afraid of, what I'm afraid of the most is that virologist was seeing something, and it was a virus. And that was sitting in the middle of our emergency department with all those hundreds of people. There's no way that simple solutions will fix this. This is going to take some concerted effort. I'd like to end by saying is that I'm absolutely shocked that there hasn't been more done in the last year. Even just simple communication about how we could help our government agencies and we could partner as healthcare, medicine, and nursing to help fix this. We do need to look at better coordination from the government. We truly believed in the Institute of Medicine and in our committee that it was spread out to too many agencies. There's no one agency that's responsible. There's no champion for emergency care. We believe that the whole system had to be looked at. And we believed that there had to be substantial thought, redesign, and re-engineering, not of the system, but of things like MTALA and why patients wind up in the emergency department when they could go to primary care. We, fact, we felt that we needed to look at making hospitals and EMS systems accountable. We just weren't going to make recommendations to you from the Institute of Medicine that said, do this for us. We want to make this system accountable. And we looked for one of the best successes in medicine to fix it, and that was the trauma system. Trauma systems have been around for about 30 years. They are actually come from the experience that we had during Vietnam, and that military system was transformed and translated into civilian care systems. Trauma systems are regionalized, they are accredited, they are credentialed, and they are accountable because they report their results to the public and to the government. And the Institute of Medicine and its interdisciplinary committee put this at the center of the committee report to redesign emergency care based on regional systems that are accountable and they report their outcome. I think that's an important thing. Last, there were two things that came about during the two and a half years that I served in the Institute of Medicine that I think you're aware of. One you're very aware of, and that is the inability of the health care system and specifically the emergency care system to respond for surge capacity, for mass casualty, and disaster. If on Wednesday afternoon we had had another van or school bus crash, only the dedication and commitment of the nurses and physicians would have taken care of those patients because we had no room. You know about that. You know about that because of some of the hearings that have taken place that emergency care cannot respond. We don't have the capability to do it. We don't have the capacity to do it. The other one that I think is quite frightening that the Institute of Medicine discovered is the workforce issues. If you look beyond the emergency department, there is a tremendous crisis developing on the surgical side to staff the in-house care that must take place after the emergency department. One of the biggest things that we revealed is, is, in fact, after the emergency physicians resuscitate, it is, in fact, in these emergencies, many specialists, cardiologists, neurologists, and surgeons that are called to render care and complete care within the hospital. The shortage of physicians and specifically surgeons that are responding to and in the future as we try to cope with caring for about 80 million boomers, the shortage of surgeons is a profound thing that is in this report and needs to be addressed. Thank you, Mr. Cummings, for your comment. Thank you very much. Dr. Johnson. Mr. Chairman. Is it on? I am now. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I wanted to first start by giving you an idea of my practice environment because I, I don't work in an inner city or a, a highly urbanized area. I work in a suburban emergency department that sees approximately 45 to 50,000 visits a year. And we also function as a satellite children's facility, so we see approximately 40 percent of our volume are children. And I want to tell you that even in our sleepy suburban community, which uh, I believe is typical of almost every community in America outside of the urban setting. Um, I'm in an environment that continues to be understaffed. We are underfunded. We are overworked, overwhelmed, and overcrowded. And I want to address each one of those things for you. First of all, let me give you the story. It was interesting listening to Dr. Schwab talking about when his experience, because my experience is a little bit more profound than that. Because one day when I was working in the emergency department, a frantic mother brought in a child who was choking to death and was blue. And I did not even have a single bed available in my emergency department. I debated for a few seconds, should I just put the child on the floor in order to try and open the airway? Did not even have a bed. And fortunately, because of the dedicated staff that we work with in our emergency departments, nurses, technicians, they were able to scramble a patient out of a bed and pull the bed over to the middle of the emergency department hallway where I proceeded to pull an apricot pit out of this child's trachea. Now, you know, it, it struck me then and there when I looked up, and you know how these things go, you're kind of a little adrenalinized at that point. You look up and you see about 30 people looking at you. Most of them are patients. Some of them sitting with their gowns that are kind of open in the back. So it always makes it an interesting sight as well. Um, I'm here to tell you that even in my sleepy community of Mission Viejo, California, a suburban area, there are days when I don't have adequate resources to take care of patients. One of the big problems that we are facing, I think, in this country is an explosion in the volume of patients we're seeing. In my area, for example, we've had tremendous growth in population because of construction. And I understand that we're not the only area of the country that's seeing that kind of explosion. But one of the problems that we're seeing is the lack of infrastructure to help support that explosion in population growth. So as a result, we are confronted with the issue of overwhelmed, overcrowding every day. We have a situation where we also have patients that are literally living in our emergency department for more than a day at a time. We have psychiatric patients sitting in our emergency department because we cannot get resources to them or are there beds in my immediate area to send those patients to. Most people have this misunderstanding about overcrowding in emergency departments. I'd like to dispel that myth once and for all here in this committee. Overcrowding in emergency departments is not due to patients who have minor problems coming into the emergency department. It is due to patients who are sick sitting in beds in my emergency department when there are no beds, no capacity in the hospital to get them upstairs. So I can't get new patients back into my emergency department. That means that I have to contact my charge nurse and let her know that when I don't have any beds any longer, because they're full of inpatients in my department, I have to let her know the ambulances cannot come here. So that means although we are a cardiac receiving center where I have a cath lab available 24 hours a day to take the sickest cardiac patients in my community, I cannot get them into my hospital because I don't have a bed for them. So I have these tremendous capabilities, tremendous talent, tremendous dedication and I cannot get these patients to my facility to take care of them. All I ask of you, and all, all I ask of this committee and of, of the federal government is to help me do what I do best, and that's save lives and take care of patients. I cannot do that unless we have the resources. I think the Institute of Medicine report laid it out very clearly that we are underfunded, we don't have adequate resources. We're talking about a surge capacity. There is no surge capacity left within our hospital environment. By the way, my hospital is located approximately 30 minutes north of a nuclear power plant. And I can guarantee you if there's any place that needs surge capacity, it's my facility. It just does not exist. Let me just summarize by saying the American College of Emergency Physicians has, over the last few years, brought this attention to everyone we could possibly bring it to. We've held a rally on the lawn of the Capitol. We've had <coughs> surveys that have been put together. We've even introduced a bill, the Access to Emergency Medical Services Act of 2007. And I know this is an oversight committee, but the fact of the matter is that we are making every effort to try and come to solutions that will help solve this problem. But once again, my sleepy community town is, I think, average America. And if we are seeing the same problems that the urban and suburban 
environments you're seeing all over this country, then I think we should all be very, very afraid of what's happening. I think we really need to do something and do something <coughs> quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Johnson. Dr. O'Connor. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I was struck by the opening comments that I heard uh, several of you made, uh, Congressman Davis, Congresswoman Watson, and Congressman Cummings. Uh, I agree with everything that you said, and I was struck by the uniformity of, of recognition that our health care system, our emergency care system, is in a state of disarray. Uh, I look back at my own career. I've been in practice for over 20 years. I've been involved in the medical direction of pre-hospital care for uh, just about as long, uh, the instruction of pre-hospital care providers perhaps longer. And I, I want to try to distill what, what my views were about how we've gotten to the place we're at today. What I've seen throughout my career is tremendous strides in care. We take care of uh, patients with myocardial infarction, MI, heart attack, uh, right now who we used to have no other treatment options other than to provide comfort measures only and not truly offer definitive care. We have made tremendous strides in trauma care, uh, in stroke care, and the list goes on. However, we're hampered by our ability to provide that care. We have state-of-the-art technology, and yet we're practicing in a non-state-of-the-art environment where patients uh, who are just hapless bystanders witness things that perhaps they should not see. Uh, in a crowded emergency department environment. The conditions uh, in an emergency department, you know, we, we have the tools to provide the best care that we can. The environment is so crowded that it sometimes creates a major obstacle to that. Now, I look back on my career with EMS and pre-hospital care. It was really sparked by funding that goes back uh, really into the 1970s, uh, prompted by uh, uh, trauma and uh, the neglected disease of modern society. Over that time, the initial funding was at quite a high level. Uh, in 19, uh, or in uh, 2007 dollars, it's about 1.5 billion. It was 300 million at the time. That since has dwindled. And while a solution to the problem is not to throw money at it, I do believe that increased funding for EMS would be one possible solution. The second part is uh, to look at some of the funding agenc agencies that provide care for EMS and to see how best to spend that money. If you look at certain EMS programs, the Rural EMS Grant Program existed to support training and equipment for smaller communities. That has since been eliminated in funding. If you look at the Trauma Systems Planning Grant, that also has been eliminated. <coughs> EMS for Children has to continually fight for their funding year in and year out. And it's only through the, uh, the focused effort of members of Congress that these programs have sustained funding from year to year. Regarding the, uh, one of the recommendations from the Institute of Medicine report was to uh, establish a lead federal agency. I have some comments in my written testimony regarding that. There currently exists the Federal Interagency Committee for EMS, which uh, should, is the ideal body really to, uh, to look at how to establish a lead agency. You know, I think it's essential that we have a lead agency in the federal government, one to champion EMS causes. If you go back to the fall of 2001, September 11th specifically, the public concern over our preparedness for terrorism, uh, mass casualty events, resulted in funding for police and fire and other agencies. EMS was notably absent from that funding pool. While I strongly believe that we need to have public safety, strong public safety uh, uh, resources, such as police and fire, I also think that EMS is in a unique position where they work at the intersection of public safety plus public health. In fact, it's the integration of public safety with emergency health care. So in closing, I would just like to uh, thank everyone for your uh, efforts. We in emergency care uh, take pride in what we do. Uh, we, I believe, provide excellent care to patients. We're somewhat hampered by the resources that we're being given and the, the demands on our time and effort. If we're given the opportunity to and the resources to improve that care, we will uh, welcome that opportunity. So thank you. I want to thank all of you for your testimony. Uh, we will go into uh, a questioning now, and um, we will stick by a uh, strict five-minute uh, five rule. Um, I'd like to ask the question of all, all three witnesses. Since back in 2002, the Congress has appropriated some $2.7 billion to the department to improve the ability of communities to respond to emergencies that cause mass casualties. 
According to an analysis prepared for this committee by the Congressional Research Service, critics have charged the program over the years with lacking sufficient focus to adequately direct funds in meaningful directions and with failing to assure that emergency health care services will be available consistently across jurisdictions. Have the billions of dollars spent by the Department to enhance, that's the HHS, to enhance surge capacity for bioterror attacks and other mass casualty events made any difference in your daily practice? Dr. Swab, we'll start with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an interesting thing. If you look at the IOM report and some of the data that we looked at is that of all those billions and billions of dollars, if I can track this back, uh, only 4 percent ever went actually into the states to look at EMS or look at preparedness. In response to your question, has any of this money affected myself, our trauma center, or the emergency department, the answer is categorically no. I, I, I don't think we could track a dime into the actual practice at bedside or making our lives better. Dr. Johnson. I would have to also say no. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I sit on our advisory committee for uh, HRSA funding for trauma preparedness in California, and I can tell you that while my hospital bought a tent, it doesn't help my day-to-day -day ability to take care of patients in the emergency departments who are sitting there waiting for a bed upstairs. Dr. O'Connor. Yeah, of the money that you cited of the bioterrorism program, less than 5 percent has gone to uh, EMS mm -hmm. right. during that time period. Dr. Swab, you described a situation that has steadily worsened over many years. The crisis has been in extensively documented in, an ac in academic studies, the news media, and even the Department's own reports. From your perspective, what, if anything, has HHS done to address the problem? I think one of the most important things that I think they've done is they've listened. I wish I could say they've reacted. On the other hand, what I have to say, I've been in this business now for 30 years. Twice during that 30 years I've seen federal legislation that was directed specifically at emergency, EMS, and trauma. And then within a few years I've seen that actually that appropriation go away. Which means that they had money, we used it effectively, it went away and we can't make the sustained type of efforts. I was very heavily involved in the late 1980s and the early 1990s with HHS in designing the model trauma plan. That was three years funding that subsequently was taken away through appropriations and that whole effort failed. And honestly, all of our work really went up in smoke in that time. So I think there's a complexity here that in order for the government agencies to respond, they have to have the money in order to do it. You know, a lot of people say that money is not necessarily always the answer. You, you hit it a lot up here. And um, I've often argued that the most important thing is the effective and efficient use of the money. Um, and so I think all of you all have talked about money. And I'm just wondering what do you all see and if you can, you know, wave your magic wand and you had the money, what would be the most effective and efficient use of it? I'll start with you, Dr. Johnson, then we'll go back. Dr. Connor and then Swamp. First, Mr. Chairman, I would like to say that, for at least in my situation, unless my hospital wants to build more beds with that money, it doesn't really help my situation. More money doesn't help me personally in the emergency department. What it may do, though, is allow me to get my orthopedic surgeon to come in because they won't come in to take care of patients who are underfunded. So it may entice them to come in, and that way I can get my patient out of the emergency department a lot faster. Um, so unless my house wants to build more beds with that money, it doesn't really help me. I will say that there is no question in my mind that there are many nurses, for example, who I can't hire for my institution because the cost of living where I live is too high and the salaries are too low. So if I had that pot of money, I, first thing I would do is buy myself about 10 more nurses that would be on staff every day because that would certainly help me get, take care of my patients in a more efficient way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, give me that money. I'd take care of that. Mm -hmm. Dr. O'Connor? Yeah, I, th I think to answer your, your question, the best way to spend money is to use it in a way where it's leveraged, where it amplifies the amount of money that you're spending. I think if you look at, uh, at emergency care, uh, systems of uh, regionalization, a uh, demonstration project in that area might be one such uh, means to do that. 
uh, to look at research so that findings in efficiency and effectiveness of care can be translated across the entire U.S. population, to look at the means of establishing best practices, whether it's through a demonstration project as well. But I would encourage, uh, in terms of spending money, I mean, money is important if there isn't enough. Uh, but I think in terms of efficiently using it and uh, safeguarding the, uh, the taxpayers or, or your fiduciary responsibility, I think to look at the way to uh, really leverage the amount of money that's spent in terms of benefits to health care would be the way to go. Dr. Swab, let me, let me, as you answer that, I just want to go back to something you were saying a little bit earlier about the, you said, uh, you talked about the trauma system and how that might be helpful, if we, I mean, and, and to what we're dealing with. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yes, thank you. Let me just go back again uh, because I think it's important because the staffs have supplied you all with these references and our written, our written comments constantly refer to the IOM report. The IOM, re, the IOM committee, we worked for a year trying to find something that worked for a tactical solution, not a strategic solution, tactical. And what we did, and my colleagues to my left actually have already given you some of the successes, but the real success in organizing regional care and delivering um, one form of emergency care to life-threatening patients, life-threatened patients, was trauma, trauma systems. This has been a three-decade effort led by the American College of Surgeons but endorsed by enabling legislation in some 40 states to create regional centers in which all patients whose life and limb are threatened are brought to those centers with waiting emergency physician surgeons operating rooms. They are effective, they are efficacious, and they are cost effective. And that's not me saying that or the IOM, but in fact peer review literature. Most recent literature on that is in the New England Journal of Medicine in which a national study was looked at. Some of your states were included in the sum, in this study, some were not. Entire national study, population base, it asked the question, what advantage to the patient whose life is threatened does a trauma system give? and it was a 25% reduction in mortality. Now, we thought in the IOM that if we could use that as a blueprint and apply those components, efficient, effective, regional, not fragmented, and accountable to an emergency care system, it would be a wonderful tactic to do it. And going back to Dr. O'Connor's comments, there is a strong recommendation in the IOM to provide money immediately to set up pilot projects and studies to study that as a regional emergency care system. And so I think the tactical solution is there in print. I think it's proven in that field of emergency care, and I think it's doable. And if you ask me what I would do with the money, Mr. Chairman, I would take it and I would fund those projects, those pilot projects, but I would make them accountable for what they're doing and I would require them to report that, not just to our government agencies, but to you. Before we uh, move on to Mr. Davis, I just have one, one last question. Dr. Swab, and any you all may answer this too, as you know, CMS has proposed a rule that would cut hundreds of millions of federal Medicaid dollars from current supplemental payment to hospitals and provide significant amounts of uncompensated emergency and trauma care. The purpose of these payments is to, to help these hospitals offset the financial losses they incur by providing those services. Last month, Congress enacted a one-year moratorium prohibiting CMS from implementing this rule. In its public notice about the rule, CMS officials stated, and I quote, we anticipate the rule's effect on actual patient services to be minimal, end of quote. Do you agree with that? I don't agree with that, and, and I, I have to tell you that th this was a real shocker to all of us. This was a shocker to me. Forty to fifty percent of all the patients that my emergency medical colleagues and I touch have their reimbursement essentially administered under CMS to in any way give those patients less ability to pay us to cover our costs, many times or not even covered our costs, to me is absurd. And what's interesting about this is, is that CMS should be standing up for the consumer, the patient, and this month's in Consumer Reports, the back page is entirely dedicated to the consumer 
in what it calls the greatest crisis and the most threatening part of health care, emergency care, and it tells the consumer how to get through an emergency department visit. For us to think that we're going to lose more funding is absolutely absurd at this time. Dr. Johnson. From what I understand, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's been reported that hospitals lose approximately lose more money on Medicare patients that come through the emergency department than on some other groups of patients. And the idea is 50 percent of hospitals are report being in the in the red when they admit patients through the ED that are covered by Medicare. So I do think that CMS, if it can increase the funding for those patients, it would actually assist in getting those patients into the hospital more effectively. Dr. Connor. Yeah, uh, in terms of uh, speaking to the pre-hospital uh, impact of, of those cuts, uh, as it stands now, uh, Medicare share of transports uh, is greater than uh, the share of payments. Medicare patients represent 40 percent of the total transports while comprising only 31 percent of the revenue. And to have that money further cut would increase that gap accordingly. Uh, the uh, ambulance providers are paid substantially below their average cost even to provide routine transport. Uh, in fact, one other aspect to this is that in general pre-hospital care providers are reimbursed for transport only, not for the level of or not for the care or specific care that's provided. So I think those cuts would have dramatic and deleterious impact. Thank you very much. Mr. Davis. Um, thank you and thank you very much for what you do. I, my son had a, got a broken jaw in a uh, game, it was, it was the Swarthmore Haverford game and baseball broke his jaw in uh, it's worth more and of course he had to wait to get a physician that would do because of tort laws at the point but we took him to emergency and I had my first hand experience with Pennsylvania's <laughs> rules. Let me ask you in orders of magnitude, um, I'm, I'm trying to get an order of magnitude here in terms of the, the problems and how we can solve it here. Uh, tort laws play a role, there's no question about that in emergency rooms. Uh, mandated emergency care where we're serving people in many cases who are either here illegally or are uninsured and can reimburse nothing play a role in this and are squeezing out other people who could appropriately uh, pay. Um, we have uh, certificates of need and these issues limit beds and try to allocate them in an appropriate fashion and yet one of the problems I'm hearing is that we don't have enough beds in some areas that if they per perhaps could get the appropriate certifications you could create more beds which would be able to alleviate moving people from emergency rooms uh, to beds. Um, federal reimbursability, which of course the private sector also pegs reimbursability now to some cases to Medicare, being very, very low. So even if you get a patient, the reimbursability of that doesn't always cover the cost and when you add in the uninsured and everything else it creates a huge problem. And the ability to attract and retain good people, whether doctors, where we still have a shortage, or nurses. As you rank all of these, what are the, all of them have a federal component. What do we do, how, it, 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 how important is each one, are some of them uh, really uh, red herrings or are they all important in terms of trying to get, get an understanding in our arms around this problem? I'll start with you, Dr. Schwab, and we just move down and just feel free. You're just picking on me because your son was playing in Pennsylvania. Um, um, let me say this. That there, they're excellent questions, each of its own. We could spend a fair amount of time. And I think you have to dissect and drill down and look at how it affects emergency care. I want to start with the first one you mentioned, if I could, sir, and that's tort reform. A lot of, a lot of things in the last 10 years, including a major crisis in Pennsylvania trauma centers just a few years ago that, that Governor Ed Rendell handled beautifully for us. And, and what was blamed for that was malpractice. If one tries to ascribe that tort reform will solve the crisis in emergency care, I would say that it is, it's not fair. That's a much bigger issue. However, where it affects us is that there is no difference in our malpractice risk, our malpractice premiums for delivering care to an emergency patient versus that patient in which you have established a doctor-patient relationship. And what's interesting about that, again in the report, if you look at it, the majority of the patients are life-threatened, many of which cannot speak for themselves, comas, 
hit in the head, having a heart attack or a stroke, we can't get information about them. We have no information about them, yet we're required to treat within a matter of seconds. I knew nothing about this man whose chest I had to open. I didn't know his allergies. I didn't know his medicines. I didn't know anything. I didn't know if he had diabetes. I didn't know anything. But I had to do something, as do my colleagues sitting next to me. But what's interesting is my malpractice is exactly the same. I get no benefit for doing that. I get no, I get no recluse from that. And I am at extremely high risk if one goes ahead and tracks malpractice complaints into emergency care. They're very high. So I haven't answered your question comprehensively, but at least your first topic, I think, what we said in the IOM report is, is that there needs to be a study done immediately to look at some way of relieving the physicians and nurses that are applying or giving emergency care. In, and by, by that, we defined and said we should define what an emergency episode is. And in that episode, we should go ahead and look at how the government may recluse us from some of the malpractice burden we have if we're truly delivering life-saving care. Thank you, sir. Everybody agrees reimbursements are, are, are low, and that, that drives a lot of this as well, and the uninsured. And so there's a federal component, but I appreciate your answer. Dr. Johnson? Uh, well, I, I think CMS does have some things they can do that to help alleviate some of the problems. You know, they are a very powerful organization because they hold the purse strings, and hospitals do whatever they can to try and get a hold of those funds. And I think CMS could use its purchasing power to get hospitals to probably move patients upstairs by creating financial incentives to reduce crowding and reduce boarding and discourage boarding within the facility. If hospitals achieve high efficiency and get patients out of their EDs in a, an efficient way, they can be rewarded by CMS for doing that. And if they are not, then they can also have the big stick, so to speak, to be penalized for not moving patients out of the ED. I think, for example, we have observation codes that CMS also could expand upon to provide additional funding where we can now put patients in areas of the hospital where we can observe them that may not even require full hospital admission. And that actually might save money in the long run for the system. Finally, I do think that you probably all are aware that there are many different types of patients that hospitals can put into beds upstairs. Some of those are nice elective surgeries where it's totally predictable how long they'll be in the hospital and how much that is going to cost them. And it seems that CMS is more than happy to pay a certain fee for those patients. But when they have an emergency, de patient, emergency department patient who is very ill, they, the hospital cannot collect enough money to cover their costs. So if CMS were to expand and, and prioritize emergency department patients over those nice elective predictable patients, that actually might get patients into beds a lot more efficient and open up the emergency department beds. Can I just follow up on, on the tort with you very quickly on the, on the tort side of it? Because Dr. Schwab makes a case, you probably know less about your patients than anybody else when they come in. You have to make uh, uh, life-saving decisions based on limited information, and if it's if, if it's the wrong decision, you're going to you're going to see it in court, and you're going to have to revisit that. Is it is is the standard pretty tough for emergency? What's been your experience? I would have to be perfectly honest and say that there's a tremendous amount of defensive type of medicine that's practiced in emergency departments. There are many things that we do, knowing full well that we're just covering the base, so to speak, and probably is not as important in the care of the patient. Uh, we, if I had some relief, uh, some liability protection, I think that I could also practice in a more efficient way. Absolutely. Thank you. Dr. Connor. Uh, yes. Uh, in terms of uh, liability protection, many EMS services are protected to the level of uh, gross negligence, which is may maybe one such model to look at emergency care in its total as a uh, means to overcome this problem. <clears throat> in terms of uh, your question, uh, there are staffing issues, there are Let hospital issues. Gross negligence being a much higher standard of negligence to show would give you some relief and some not, not having to do some of these That's defensive right. mechanisms that you would, there's cons consensus on that, that's an that's a easier standard for you to operate under at least. It is. Yes. Okay, sir. Yes. Thank you. And, and it's been protective and it works in pre-hospital care systems that might be a good model to follow. Uh, I've, I never uh, would have thought that uh, EMS pre-hospital work would be impacted by things such as nursing home placement, you know, things on the other end of uh, health care in terms of the throughput through the system. You know, I looked at the uh, cover uh, that's now six years old crisis uh, in the ER, and it really is a crisis in the health care system. I think the, uh, our current admission and discharge process from the inpatient setting uh, is broken, and it's reflected by the overcrowding stories that we've heard. It's reflected by ambulances that have to divert, thereby creating a problem in a second hospital that they divert to. Uh, ambulance diversions are 
particularly problematic because they tend to cause a rapid downward spiral of the entire system in that region. So I think in answer to your question, it's not a, it's not a simple thing to answer. Uh, I think that as a first step, we may want to try to understand the problem just a little bit better. Mr. Yarmouth. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to get at that um, topic uh, a little more extensively. I'm trying to get my arms around whether the, and I know it's hard to generalize across the entire country and all sorts of different communities, to what extent this is a, a total patient capacity problem versus, a, and therefore more of a, a method of dispers dispersion problem as opposed to um, just an emergency room capacity problem. Thank you. Dr. Schwab, you want to start with that? Thank you. Well, let me just say that the difficulty here is, if I can just have you think about a large geopolitical area. So you've got a metropolitan service area, a suburban area, and a rural area. There's a certain number of hospitals, EMS units, emergency departments that render care for their citizens. There is no doubt that there is a disbursement or a fragmentation problem. And again, in the report, we've identified that and said one of the things that could really help efficiencies, if we design this regional emergency care system, that all components of that care system, the rural ambulance core up in the mountains versus the ones in the city, are all talking electronically and in real time so that we can take people to where there are open beds. There's no doubt about that. That's the term regionalization. But then there is also a problem in that what we've got to do is we've got to look at how those hospitals that are getting them, and especially if the patient needs specialized care, cardiac, neurologic, trauma, obstetrical, or pediatric, that those centers that function as the regional emergency care center are in fact enabled through proper funding and proper resources to be able to maximize their efficiency and to be able to move patients through. Dr. O'Connor just mentioned he never thought that the nursing home would affect the EMS. I can tell you every day we have now continuously dedicated very high level nursing and administrators who are helping to get people out to skilled nursing facilities rehabilitation so we can take people in. It's all connected, Congressman. But I think what you have to look at is, again, how you might design this regionalized system, which would help us disperse people better, but also not lose sight that not all hospitals can deliver all types of care. To, to what extent, and, and maybe Dr. O'Connor can address this, to what extent do you believe that the economic, the competitive aspect of institutions exacerbates this problem? Uh, I know in, in my community we have several very highly competitive <coughs> hospital entities who are um, uh, some for profit, not most not for profit now, but we know that means in the healthcare business mostly non tax paying, not they don't make profits. So I'm, I'm curious as to whether you've done any analysis of how big a problem that is in, in this context. I, I can give you some examples. Uh, Locally, we uh, established a, um, uh, again, I won't name the locale, but we established a pre-hospital 12 lead program to identify patients with uh, heart attack, with uh, you know, uh, acute myocardial infarction in the pre-hospital setting so that they could go to the place where they could receive angioplasty if necessary and found uh, tremendous resistance from some of the uh, smaller hospitals which viewed it as a uh, potential competitive disadvantage for taking care of all patients, not just the heart attack patients. I went back to them with data that showed how many patients this involved and it was such a small number and they were the types of patients that were being transferred out anyway uh, by the hospital so that they were more accepting. We started the program and it's been very successful. But I say this because if you uh, can educate the administration of these other hospitals, they'll realize that it's not really a competitive disadvantage but what you're doing is saving a secondary transfer or taking patients who are too sick for that hospital or require services that could not be rendered by that hospital. One quick question before my time's up and anybody can answer. Uh, we talked about this regional, regional approach and I understand how that would be very important here. Is any, uh, to your knowledge, is any region or any community in the country doing a good job at this? Are there any models we can look at to uh, try to 
roll out across the country? Well, I, I don't want to play to the <clears throat> to your chairman, but uh, the uh, model that actually occurs in the state of Maryland is probably an excellent model to follow to look at. As far as trauma systems go, the model in San Diego, as far as, as, far as models in emergency medical coordination, the greater Pittsburgh region are areas that are well known. Coming back to the question and answering it, how would you use your money, if I can combine the two questions, what we need to do is formally study those and see what the best practices are, again, for efficacy, efficiency, and effectiveness, and, and make sure that that's not just our feeling, but in fact we can prove that to the to the country and to our citizens. Thank you. If, if I can just follow up on that, Mr. Chairman. Um, the American College of Emergency Physicians have introduced a bill into the Congress which actually will look at things like this, such as ideal models, and look at some of the impediments to access to emergency care by our patients. Thank you very much. Ms. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Johnson, welcome. welcome. Uh, I, uh, I apologize that I no longer represent Mission Viejo, but redistricting was not kind to me in my loss of Orange <laughs> County. Governor Schwarzenegger has proposed in your home state, in our home state, a broad sweeping universal coverage initiative uh, that uh, requires that employers either take fiscal responsibility for their employees or pay a 4% fee uh, that would go into a pool to help fund the, uh, those activities which are necessary as a result of their failure. And emergency rooms obviously become the uh, uh, the, uh, the first choice of people who have no formal health coverage. Uh, in Orange County, if in fact we were able to accomplish that through uh, private means to ensure that every individual had either state coverage if they were unemployed or indigent in some other way, or company coverage, uh, back door, front door, depending upon whether or not an employer provided that care or paid the 4%, how much would that change what you see at the emergency room in yours and, and neighboring hospitals? Uh, that's an excellent question. And let me answer that by saying that in the last, since 1993, the number of patients visiting emergency departments has risen to 115 million visits a year. And most of those visits are patients who are insured. They are insured. So it's not a question of not having funding and going to the emergency department because it's a place of last resort. It's a question of not having access to primary care capabilities within the community and as a result, the emergency department becomes the facility where they are forced to go because they can't get in to see their physician. Or worse, they go in to see their physician who then says you must go to the emergency department. So in, in that regard, whether there's a universal coverage in California or not, it probably would not change in our particular environment in Mission Viejo. So how do we reverse that? Uh, and I realize Mission Viejo is a, is a wealthy uh, community in the center of the greater LA, Orange County, San Diego megalopolis. So if, if it can be fixed in a uh, suburban well-to-do neighborhood would seem to be the easiest place to fix it. How do we make those changes that get people to the front door of an urgent care or to the front door of routine uh, medical treatment through a normal relationship and not at your emergency uh, room door? Well, once again, uh, given the, the reality that most of the patients who actually come to the emergency department are absolutely sick and actually need to be there, we actually see a very small volume of patients who actually have minor problems that really do not need to be in the emergency department. So unless we were willing to build another hospital in Mission Viejo, California, we are not going to solve the problem. When you say a, a sick, do you mean life-threatening, immediate injury? or Requiring admission. Requiring, and what percentage did you say that was? Uh, we probably see, I'm going to take a guess, between 20 and 30 percent of the patients who present to the emergency department there require admission. 20%. 20 percent. 20 to 30 percent, correct. What about the 80 percent? I would say of the other remaining 70 percent, at least half of those patients are those that require being seen in the emergency department and probably receiving care within two hours. So what have we done in our society that created this huge rise? Lack of uh, primary care access I think is driving a lot of it. I think patients are waiting until they're sicker before they seek health care. So they're insured well-to-do suburban neighborhood and they're not going to primary care because there's no access. Correct. They call up their physician. I'm sure you've experienced this yourself. If you call your physician and say, I need an appointment to be seen because I have a cough, and they say, I'll see you three weeks from now, that doesn't work. And then you wait a week until you have your pneumonia, then go to the emergency department. Okay. I, I guess I'll ask one more time because this is, this is an area 
that you know, I want to show light on. And by the way, it, it, it is your neighborhood that I miss because, in fact, if anything can be fixed, it can be fixed in, in southern Orange County uh, because the means are there. Uh, you're saying we need more doctors so doctors don't say come in three weeks. I mean, what, what really will change that? Uh, is it, do we need urgent care? Do we need community clinics? Tell me what we need in one of the richest ge geographic areas in the country that we don't have and why. There is no doubt, uh, sir, that the entire health care system, I think, is broken. I think all those things are possible solutions. Uh, I do think that, for example, we could expand our emergency department capabilities to add more observation capability, for example, and keep patients out of the inpatient service, but th who requires some prolonged level of care, perhaps in between the inpatient service and the ED. Well, well, yesterday well. I was, or the day before yesterday, I was with Michael Moore, uh, the, uh, the maker of SICKO. And, and, I, and the, the group I was with, I was the only person that wanted to preserve the private care system. Everybody else in that room, uh, from Mr. Conyers and Don Down, they wanted to have a single-payer, government-driven system. And I have to ask you, do you know of a single-payer, government-led system that would fix this? And what, what is that model if one exists? And I think any model that we create in the United States of America will be unique to this particular country. And I don't think we can look to other models to be the, the only model that's available. I think we'll have to try and find our own model that will work for most of our citizens. Anyone else want to weigh in on that in the remaining time the chairman gives me? Mr. Chairman, uh, if, you'll, if you'll think of Philadelphia as Orange County. Um, the interesting I love Philadelphia. You had a great <laughs> convention for us there, and I was there just a few weeks ago. It, it is, except for the heat, the humidity, if, you stay, if you're on the 19th floor and you look out, it does look like San Diego. <laughs> we're going to allow you to answer that question, Mr. Schwab, because we, we're running out of time, but you go ahead, Dr. Schwab. I'm In sorry. short, uh, I, I don't think one solution fits all. I'll go back again to the IOM report. We looked at this, and specifically what we, uh, uh, what we said with no doubt, in, including one of our recommendations, is we have to increase access to primary care in all aspects of the population. Because, according to the analysis, if you look at those 114 million ED visits, a huge percentage of those, maybe not where Dr. Johnson practices, are for non-life-threatening emergency chronic care conditions for people who can find care in no other area. And in Philadelphia, in our hospital, that's a huge part of our emergency medical faculty's burden. Thank you. Thank As, you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the yes, indulgence. No problem. As we move on to Mr. Cooper, let me just say this. Um, as I listen to the testimony, it is frightening. I mean, when you think about a, an area like, for example, where you operate, uh, Dr. Johnson, to have the kind of problems that you just stated, it's just amazing. So that, then I guess it gets kind of, kind of quadruples in an area where you're from, Dr. Schwab. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I, yes. Yes, easily. At least. <laughs> At least. Uh, uh, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The late economist John Maynard Keynes once said that we're all the slaves of some defunct economist. I'd like to suggest that we may be somewhat the slaves of the major federal intervention in this area in the last several decades, the Mtala law. Yeah. When you see graphs like the ones we've been presented with where patient demand is going up, 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 but the number of emergency rooms and emergency capacity is going down, 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 there's a fundamental problem. Because any regular economic system, when demand goes up, supply goes up. So thinking strategically for a moment, I think that we, what we really need here is um, a recognition of the role that money plays. Mr. Iso question why in a rich community there's a shortage of primary care. Well, it's pretty well known, at least at the elite medical schools, no one wants to be a primary care doctor. Because being a primary care doctor, being an emergency doctor, pays much less than being a specialist. And the work is often more difficult and carries other risks. You get what you pay for. And you don't get what you don't pay for. You also don't get what you mandate without funding. And if we had a third panel of hospital administrators, the people who actually allocate resources between the grassroots and 60,000 feet, I think most all of them would tell you, whether a nonprofit or for profit, that the ER business is a very bad business to be in. 
That's why new fangled hospitals, specialty hospitals, oftentimes don't even include an ER. And that's why in a celebrated case that I'm surprised hasn't been mentioned today in a Texas specialty hospital, they had to call 911 from the hospital because they had no emergency capacity within the hospital. So it seems to me that if you look at programs like Medicare and Medicaid, the truth is they really don't pay enough for the services received. And they haven't for years. And everybody knows that. But we don't do anything about it. And a couple billion dollars here or there isn't going to solve the problem because the problem is so immense. You know, these specialty programs, you know, because bioterrorism or things like that are fashionable at the moment, they're a little more than band-aids for the, the needs that you have. When the government wants to tackle a problem, it can. None of you are old enough to remember the old Hill Burton hospitals that were built pretty much nationwide after World War II because we needed more hospital capacity. Well, today we need more ER capacity. And especially that surge capacity that many of you have alluded to is extremely expensive because by definition, surge capacity is not used a good bit of the time. And you look silly having paid for all these resources to be on hand when well, they're not used. But think of this analogy. With fire protection, it costs you more the farther you live from a good fire department. Well, we may, we may be reaching the time where health insurance will cost you more uh, the farther you live or the less able your local ER or ED is. Because I think Dr. Schwab mentioned a 25% risk or increase in mortality if, if you don't receive proper emergency care? Proper trauma care. Yeah. So these are serious issues that will take far more than this committee's resources to deal with, but I would like to suggest that fundamentally it's an economic problem. It is. And yet um, physicians, others are not trained to think in those terms. But solving them I think will take an economic solution. So I see I've overstepped my time, Mr. Chairman. But it's more of a statement than a question, anyway. You actually, you actually have about a minute because the timer uh, was malfunctioning. Oh, <laughs> timer malfunction. <laughs> That's a, uh, well, I would welcome any response that y'all have. I, you know, as I say, it's more of a statement than a, a question. Yeah, if I, I may, just very briefly, I, I think you know your, your comments are, uh, are right on target. Uh, we are, in many ways. Uh, I'm very comfortable uh, with EMTALA because any patient who comes in, I have to see, and that's uh, the way I would like it. Uh, I look at the uh, the curves in the reports or the but remember graphs. that EMTALA has two parts: a requirement mm -hmm. that you see, and then also no pay. Yeah. So, and I, I, I was going to say when, when EMTALA first was enacted, I was talking to uh, a, a leader in the uh, uh, health insurance field who said, "I'm not paying for the medical screening exam. There's no." Uh, no reason I have to. That's, of course, uh, softened somewhat, but I was struck by that, that stance. I, I think if you look at the number of visits in emergency care, in many ways uh, we are victims of our own success. A patient can get a, a very elaborate workup in a very brief period of time. Uh, if you did a similar workup as an outpatient, it would take days to weeks. So I think that's in part, uh, part of the explanation for demand, that even if uh, we had something along the lines of universal, universal health coverage, demand would still be quite high, would be my opinion. Mr. Murphy. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, I spent uh, four years as chairman of uh, the Public Health Committee in the state of Connecticut, and part of the reason that I sought a seat here in Congress was that it was pretty apparent that this wasn't going to be a 50-state strategy, that there needed to be a federal solution to the issue of overcrowding in the ER. And uh, I want to ask the three of you uh, a sort of uh, unfairly simple question. It, it strikes me, as we're talking about potential solutions here, that there are sort of three areas in which you can focus your efforts. Uh, first, you can focus your efforts on trying to prevent people from getting to the ER in the first place, either through greater access to primary care or through trying to broaden those that have insurance. Second, you can focus on the ER itself, greater resources there, greater coordination between sites. Uh, and third, as Mr. Johnson, uh, Dr. Johnson noted, you can expand the ability to move patients out of the ER. You can broaden and expand the capability of uh, hospital inpatient services, uh, i.e. sort of open up the uh, potential uh, uh, to move patients out more quickly. And I guess it would be helpful for me, at the very least, to get a sense of how you might prioritize 
those three approaches. Uh, if we had to focus in one place first, second, and third, uh, preventing people from getting there, making the process itself in the ER more efficient, or thirdly, trying to open up capacity to get people out of the ER, um, how might you recommend uh, us approaching that, or is there a fourth that I'm missing? Uh, I would certainly recommend the final recommendation, which would be to open up capacity by ending boarding of patients in the emergency department. By ending boarding and opening up beds in the emergency department, you all of a sudden eliminate the problem of ambulance diversion. You basically allow patients to be seen in the ED, and if they have no access to primary care, then we're more than happy to take care of them there. Most emergency departments have figured out that if patients have minor problems, they can actually hit, they can either wait in the waiting room for who knows how long, or they're seen in, a, in an, another area of the ED where the minor care cases can be seen efficiently. But once you at least have bed capacity in the emergency department, you can do what we're there to do, which is to save lives. And getting those boarded patients out is, should be the number one priority, I believe. Yeah, I, I would uh, agree that the, uh, the third priority is, is the key, the increased capacity, because what that would in turn allow is for improved efficiencies within the department. I think a lot of the inefficiencies that occur in the emergency department now are directly attributable to patient boarding hours where staff uh, are forced to take or will take care of patients who uh, are normally in the inpatient setting. As far as uh, keeping patients who don't belong there out, I think just by our waiting times and the crowding issue, we sort of do that already. Uh, we, uh, we've uh, looked locally at uh, some of our EMS uh, transports and patients with seemingly minor complaints such as headache self-triage with a higher acuity if they call EMS or if they come to the university emergency department as opposed to an urgent uh, outpatient clinic, they tend to be sick or tend to have more serious illness than if not. In substitute of Dr. Swab answering that question, let me just ask one last one. Um, and that is the issue of psych patients. Uh, one of the greatest capacity issues for inpatient beds in Connecticut is our lack of inpatient psych beds, adult psych beds uh, in particular. How much of a problem uh, right now uh, is the lack of capacity on the back end to get uh, psych patients, both juvenile and adult, out of the ER and into a, a more community-based system of care or uh, an inpatient uh, uh, system of care? I can summarize that in a single word, huge. In my department, for example, uh, one to two patients a day that come into my department are psychiatric patients. Even after we've done all the medical screening, they could potentially sit in my emergency department from a period of time from hours to literally up to 24 hours and supposedly would they get admitted to our hospital if there's bed capacity. But they've actually lived in our emergency department for a couple of days before we can get actually psychiatric personnel to come out and evaluate them to find a, a, pla a bed to place them. Uh, sometimes there may not be a bed to place them, and as a result, they'll have to stay in the emergency department if they're at true high risk before we can actually uh, stabilize them or have an evaluation of them to be stable to be sent home or to another institution. So it, it is, it, psych patients are a huge problem. I would love to talk with you after the hearing on uh, ways that we might be able to solve that, but this is a, this is a huge problem confronting emergency departments all over the country now. Can I? Thank you. As we uh, move to Mr. Sarbanes, let me just ask this real quick question. If you had to rate our emergency systems, uh, care systems, using hospital terms like intensive care, I mean critical condition, uh, you know, the various terms you all use, how would you all describe it? I, I, I would say it's life-threatening. We're resuscitating it on a day-to-day -day basis and it's going to die if we don't fix it. And I don't know if that's hospital terms or not, Mr. Well, it sounds pretty yeah. hospital terms to me, but it sounds like almost like uh, funeral home terms, it's, too. Let, let me just go on and say I, I meant what I said before. If it wasn't for the dedication of the nurses, the paramedics, and the physicians that struggle with this on a day-to-day -day basis, <coughs> this system would have broken already. And that was the conclusion of the Institute of Medicine's report. Dr. Johnson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe that you're looking at the proverbial canary in the, in the mine right now. You're looking at them face to face because I'm here to tell you that 
when I take my last breath in that emergency department, it will be when that system completely falls apart. And I'm on my last breaths right now, I'm telling you right now. So we are the canaries. The emergency physicians and nurses and personnel are, I mean, I've had some of my best nurses leave my department, which is, I believe, one of the best departments in California to go to other areas of the hospital, like the cath lab, where they can get paid the same salary for half the work. Mr. O'Connor, Dr. O'Connor, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think to, uh, with, you know, without using uh, hospital terms for the patient's condition. Uh, I just wanted, to, that's why I said hospital, because I wanted a brief answer. With, with uh, well, this will be very brief. Uh, in terms of uh, what's acceptable to the staff, situations that used to be considered bad days, tough days at work are now routine. And the threshold uh, to which some of the days rise is, is appalling. Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had the privilege for almost 20 years to represent as my primary clientele community hospitals in Maryland and the region, probably 25, 30 hospitals over the course of that time. And so this problem is one that I'm very familiar with from all sides, and it's almost impossible to overstate it. And you're trying your best here to do it in ways that will, will get our attention, which I think you have, but hopefully a broader attention. Dr. Schwab, you said the patient may die when asked to assess the system using those kinds of terms. Um, and Dr. Johnson, you said that the system, you're holding on before the system completely falls apart. What does that look like? What, what does the system look like when it dies or completely falls apart? I mean, what's the, what's the prospect down the road that we can look back later to the testimony in this hearing and say, well, this is not a surprise to anybody. I mean, we predicted this would happen. I mean, this is, this is sort of the fundamental human problem of if, if A, then B, if B, then C, but for some reason, we can't get it together to have the minimal amount of foresight to step in now and do something. So what does it look like when the system dies? What, what is that image for you? What's that morning after? <laughs> you know, movie that we're going to see. Well, let me uh, tell you that um, what I started with was telling you about my Wednesday afternoon, which is a pretty typical day. What you probably don't know is that if we are the most frequently closed trauma center in the state of Pennsylvania, we're closed nine times more than any other trauma center in the state because of volume. So I see this, this doomsday picture you're like asking me to give you. I see it momentarily because what happens is we close, ambulances are diverted, ambulances go to other centers, some are not trauma centers, there are no surgeons waiting, and ultimately what happens, I think, if we could ever prove it and would dare to prove it, is patients die. If the emergency system falls apart, rather than that being episodic throughout a day, it's going to be continuous, and it'll be some kind of terrible movie that I don't want to ever think about. But it is happening now in our largest cities and even some of our suburban areas. It happens. People are diverted and there is now excellent study to show that people, other patients, don't do well with diversion. They die while they're being diverted. There's also now studies, one of which coming out of ours at the University of Pennsylvania, to show that if you simultaneously, on an overload condition, overload condition, EDs fill, everybody's busy, you're doing major trauma cases and yet another, let's say, cardiac code comes in, there is data to show that those patients don't do as well. Why? Because everybody's busy. Think of O'Hare International Airport on Friday afternoon, a terrible thunderstorm, and all flights are canceled, what it is like. It is mayhem. And in mayhem, unfortunately... You've conjured up an image in my mind where the ultimate diversion is straight to the morgue, that you're going from one hospital to one hospital to one hospital, you can't get in. And eventually, you know, you just pass it by and you go, you go straight to the morgue. I mean, that's, that's what I'm hearing here. Dr. Johnson, you wanted to re respond. Uh, in your scenario, um, what would probably happen is that a um, patient would stay in the ambulance until they reached a point where they were, would die. And then the ambulance would have the ability to upgrade the patient to a code status and go to the nearest facility regardless of what right. their status would be, whether they're open or closed. Um, so patients eventually do have a 
finite period of time which they can ride around in the ambulance. Um, and I'll tell you what would happen though in your, in your scenario, it would be a very slow incremental collapse of the system beginning with the loss of specialty, uh, subspecialty capability. So neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, hand specialists, they would eventually be gone of most facilities. And probably what would happen is you'd lose them in your rural areas for those that have, them, have that specialty backup already, and then you'd lose them from your suburban areas, and what would happen is those specialists would consolidate in fewer and fewer and fewer facilities, leaving more and more facilities without any subspecialty backup, which would mean if you come in with something other than, a, to, than something that would be under the capability that I could handle as an emergency, anything that required plastic surgery or if you needed a, a hole drilled into your skull to relieve pressure from bleeding, uh, that would not happen, and you would, have, of course, then die in my facility because I would not be able to transfer you anywhere and I would not have the specialty backup in order to take care of you. So in the scenario of increasing mortality, that's how it would happen. Uh, the lack of some specialty services would allow, it would mean that patients would die at the institutions they're at. Um, we would of course see increasing ambulance diversion to the point where you'd have some facilities that would be on ambulance diversion continually. Um, I know that in my area, there was this rule in the Los Angeles area that if you're on diversion for so many hours, you then have to go off diversion for an hour before you can go back on. So it would be be a diversion, off diversion, diversion, off diversion. Well, you're, kind just, of you're describing an emergency diversion system, not an emergency uh, care system. And uh, I thank you all for being as candid uh, about this as you're as you're being. Let's talk about the solution. Okay, I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Sarvanes. As we move to Ms. Norton, uh, without talking about any of your your pers your hospitals. There are a lot of people dying, aren't there? That don't. That don't. Just I'm just based on what you all just said. There are people dying that don't have to die. That's correct. Yes. And I'm afraid. The As we speak, in the yes. United States of America. That's correct. Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is an important hearing. I'm here not only as a member of this committee, but as a member of the Homeland Security Committee, and really traumatized by what. Um, your testimony, the testimony of, of all three of you indicates I'm here uh, also as a representative of a big city in the post 9-11 period. One might say the big city in the post 9-11 period where you have to think about uh, EMS and, and where there is a lot of thinking about it, but I don't think enough thinking about what the federal government's uh, responsibility is to uh, EMS ambulance services and uh, taking uh, a point you make, Dr. O'Connor, in your uh, testimony about um, uh, about uh, the funding of, of EMS ambulance services, um, uh, looking to, um, well, more than 30 years ago, 1973, this was a clear priority because we, we funded uh, $300 million uh, to advance EMS services nationwide, you you is, is that correct? Uh, yes, that was, that was in 19, you know, 1973. Now, in real terms, you show you the kind of priority in 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 in, in real terms. 1973, uh, that amount of money would be 1.5 billion dollars today. Now, let's look at what you're coping with now. Uh, the block grant program. The whole thing has been block granted. That happened in 1981. What we're seeing is the devolution of this a whole uh, a, 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 a mission. Uh, now, as I understand it, the block grant program provides uh, these EMS services to only 16 states and only $8 million. We're talking now the equivalent of $1.5 billion 30 years ago, $8 million out of $99 million that we appropriated, uh, but only $8 million of it for, um, for uh, EMS uh, services. Um, and now, uh, as I understand it, the Bush administration wants to eliminate the block grant altogether. Now, that would mean the $8 million would be gone, would it not? Yes, it would. Well, we saw, we're seeing the decline and fall of federal responsibility, it does seem to me, then. Um, in 2006, the committee notes that the Bush administration zeroed out the small community ambulance development uh, and trauma EMS programs that was once run by HHS. We are awfully concerned here about uh, 
isolated uh, rural communities uh, and without community ambulance service, I don't need to tell experts like yourselves what the effect of that would be. Um, uh, now, the only uh, HHS program that I could find that still supports EMS services at the federal level is the uh, EMS for children. It's called EMS C program. Is that not correct? That is correct. Now, the signature, <laughs> the signature issue for this administration is Homeland Security. Uh, now, we're talking about emergency services. This, this gets to be very serious. Um, in, in the last three budgets, we could not find, uh, what we did find was the administration ha uh, had proposed to zero out even EMSC programs. Is that not correct? That's correct. That's correct. Uh, well, we're talking about a non-existing program. Um, can you explain how over 30 years we've gone from a priority uh, for uh, EMS uh, services through the federal government to essentially uh, decline and fall of such services? I mean, how could that happen? <coughs> Have the states been <laughs> clear about uh, the importance of these services? And post 9-11, uh, uh, Dr. O'Connor, you're from Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, close to where we had the, wor uh, the worst trauma, uh, second only, of course, uh, to uh, New York. Um, how could this disconnect uh, continue to get to this point? Yeah, I, I don't have an easy answer. It's been a, a slow decline over 30 years. The initial money uh, started up what we now know as pre-hospital care and EMS and was uh, largely successful. In fact, it was money that most would argue was extremely well spent. It allowed establishment of state EMS offices and really created the, the medical care that we know today in pre-hospital care. Uh, what has happened since then is that there's been a transition of funding to different areas that has resulted in it becoming very, uh, a, a very easy target to zero out the EMS programs. And I, I would just hope that the administration would reconsider some of these. Uh, so if you wanted to eliminate something and you, you had calls on the money, uh, was, was this considered more a state issue and not a federal issue, you think? So the money could be stolen from here and, as opposed to other places? Well, I think some of it has to do with just the fragmentation of EMS. There's not a, a single go-to lead agency that uh, can, can oversee where the money goes. Would it folding it into the block grant have, uh, was, was that the, the beginning of the end of the program? In retrospect, yes. We this didn't know that at the time. Do, do you think that this program should be a standalone program? Uh, would, it ha would it fare better? Would, particularly in the post 9-11 period, if it were a standalone program once again? Go ahead. Any of you? You want me to summarize and answer and then we'll. I, I think that uh, all of emergency care would fare better as a standalone program because it's not just about EMS, it's about everything we do in, in uh, unscheduled care for emergency problems. But I think if the sum total of emergency care were in a standalone uh, agency, it would, it would help for sure. If, if you're asking me about EMS alone, I, I think, once again, my comments have always been to look at the emergency care system comprehensively, a lead agency or a coordinating body with the authority, responsibility, and continuous appropriations to help us solve these problems and you as think what's needed. EMS would receive the proper priority within emergency care? I absolutely do. And in, in the IOM report, we actually call on that. And there's a separate one of the three reports is about emergency medical services and the need to fund them adequately to do their job. So only time is up. Let me just, just as we summarize and we move on to our next panel. Uh, the general lady, when she opened her questioning, she talked about Homeland Security. Um, and I was just curious if we had a Madrid level bombing today. Um, in D.C., for example, what would happen? I mean, would we be able to take care of folks? You know, America's always been good, uh, Congressman, at rising to the occasion no matter what it was. So would we be able to take care of them? The answer would be we would. The question is who would suffer because we'd have to put all of our resources taking care of those that are involved with that type of bombing. 
where would we divert our ambulances, where would the children go, and where would the routine myocardial infarction, heart attack, stroke victim go while wow, we were overwhelmed with that? I mean, to me, that so there is never. no there is no capacity really, no the, extra capacity. There is no extra capacity, and that's very clear. And and it it's it's frightening because because of our emergency departments being overloaded with routine patients and trauma patients and whatnot, it occurs on a day to day basis already. So adding on a disaster like that from ordnance explosion would just overwhelm the system. Don Johnson. I would echo that as well, Mr. Chairman. I think that in the beginning when the federal government created the monies to be used for bioterrorism protection, what it didn't do was figure out that would be a m much more at risk from a routine bombing. And as we started down the road of, of buying tents and preparing, preparing for um, pandemic flu, we have yet to deal with the day-to-day -day environment of not having enough trauma surgeons, not having enough resources in our everyday emergency department that are, that's already overwhelmed. Dr. O'Connor. Yeah, at this time of day in, uh, in every emergency department in the United States, uh, there's no capacity. So completely overwhelm the system. Thank you all very much. Your testimony has been chilling, but very, very helpful. And hopefully we can, we won't be sitting here six years from now looking at another poster that's in 12 years old. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. We'll call our next uh, set of witnesses. Uh, Dr. Kevin Yeski and Dr. Walter Korshetz. As you all come forward, we I just want the committee to know, the committee also invited Dr. Leslie Norwalk, the Acting Administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, to testify on behalf of her agency. She has declined to appear, citing schedule conflicts. She also has declined to send any other CMS officials to represent her agency. This is highly unfortunate and, frankly, inexplicable and inexcusable. The programs administered by CMS play a, a major role in the financing of our nation's health care system, including medical care, em emergency care. Indeed, all patients admitted to the hospital through the ER, over three-fifths are covered by Medicare or Medicaid. Because lack of adequate financing is one of the factors contributing to the nation's emergency care crisis, the testimony of CMS is critical to full, for full assessment of the Department of Hum Health and Human Services response to emergency, the emergency care crisis. Our staff was informed that Ms. Norwalk's schedule did not permit her to attend. However, CMS has 4,328 full-time employees. It's difficult for us to understand uh, why she could not be with us today. Uh, and so the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, which is represented here today, has only 222 full-time equivalent employees. This is just 5 percent of CMS's staff capacity. I've shared these concerns with Ms. Nowak in a letter that was sent earlier this week, and I ask unanimous consent that a copy of that letter be included in the record at this point uh, without objection so ordered. This afternoon, the committee will send a letter to Ms. Nowak posing a set of questions regarding her agency's response to the emergency care crisis. We look forward to complete and truthful responses to these questions by the close of business on Friday, June 29th. I ask unanimous consent that those responses be included in the record as well. No objections so ordered. Thank you very much, uh, doctors. Would you please stand? Raise your right hand. Do you affirm and swear to, to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you very much. We'll first hear from uh, Dr. Kevin Yeski, the Director of the Office of Preparedness and Emergency Operations and Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at HHS. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee for the invitation to speak to you today on such an important topic and one in which the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and 
response is extremely interested and engaged. I'm Kevin Yeske. I'm a board-certified emergency medicine physician, a former U.S. Public Health Service officer, and the director of the Office of Preparedness and Emergency Operations within the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response at the Department of Health and Human Services. The Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response is relatively new, being created by the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act passed in December of 2006, establishing a lead federal official for public health and medical preparedness and response within HHS. The Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, ASPR, serves as the principal advisor to the Secretary of Health and Human Services on matters related to federal public health and medical preparedness and response activities to national disasters. Additionally, the responsibilities of the ASPR include leading the federal public health and medical response to acts of terrorism, natural disasters, and other public health and medical emergencies. Two, developing imp and implementing national policies and plans related to public health and medical preparedness and response. Three, overseeing the advanced research, development, and procurement of qualified medical countermeasures. And four, providing leadership in international programs, initiatives, and policies that deal with public health and medical emergency preparedness and response. In short, the ASPR is responsible for ensuring a one-department approach to public health and medical preparedness and response and leading and coordinating the relevant activities of the HHS operating divisions. As a result of many changes, including the passage of the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act, the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response is forward-leaning and results-driven, and in just a short time since the enactment of, of the Pandemic Act has created the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, has completed transfer of two programs, a National Disaster Medical System from the Department of Homeland Security and the Hospital Preparedness Program from the Health Resources and Services Administration and has announced the National Biodefense Science Board, again, all completed since January of 2007. We're also committed to the use of evidence-based processes and scientifically founded benchmarks and objective standards called for in the law under the National Health Security Strategy. By utilizing this approach, ASPR will ensure consistency in the preparedness efforts across our nation, ensure greater accountability of local, state, and federal entities, and provide a foundation for improved coordination. The IOM Future of Emergency Care reports represent an objective assessment of the status of our nation's overall emergency care, as we've already heard. Recognizing the importance of these reports, HHS convened an internal work group to examine the 22 recommendations that were specifically directed at HHS. We evaluated the initiatives and the work group suggested a strategy to address those concerns. The work group comprised senior level representatives from the relevant operating divisions and staff divisions of the department to include the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Food and Drug Administration, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the Health Resources Services Administra Administration, the Assistant Secretary for Health, and the ASPR. The work group met regularly in 2006 and 7, and the ASPR and I were briefed about the work group's project, progress. In evaluating the recommendations, the work group concluded there, were, concluded there were three consistent items. One was the creation of a lead agency for mer emergency care within HHS to encourage efforts directed at daily emergency care issues while also supporting fed the Federal Interagency Committee on Emergency Medical Services. Second was a unity of effort within HHS to promote clinical and systems-based emergency <coughs> care research. And finally, to further promote greater regionalized approaches to, de to delivering daily emergency care. The Institute of Medicine also held regional workshops to discuss these findings and recommendations and to encourage an open dialogue with involved parties. The final capstone workshop conducted here in the, the national capital uh, included the participation of the ASPR. As already noted, We've undertaken initial steps to better understand the IOM report recommendations, and we've initiated steps within HHS to implement them. ASPR is also creating an, an administrative element within the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response that will promote <coughs> coordination and unity of, of effort across the department's emergency care activities. In closing, ASPR will continue to provide leadership in this area, fostering a department-wide approach to the nation's emergency care issues. Again, thank you for the invitation to speak today. Thank you very much, Dr. and Dr. Korshis. Is, is your mic on, sir? Is that working? Yeah. There you okay. go. Uh, 
the, uh, the emergency conditions that uh, threaten uh, patients with risk of their life and risk of their quality of health are exceedingly important to the NIH and much of our effort goes into trying to find better uh, treatments for these patients. And I'd ask you to think about our efforts in terms of a pyramid where at the bottom we have the basic research uh, issues that then go up higher into the translational research issues where what we discover from the basic uh, can be applied to disease process. And at the final top of that pyramid is the effort to get this out to patients and actually try it in patients to see if it really helps them. And, uh, and, and I would say that this, is, this has been the mode of, of research at NIH and it has actually, I think, led to significant improvements in the care of emergency patients. Um, I would say that at the current time, the difficulties you heard in the first uh, panel, they, they are impediments not only to patient care but also to research on this, this high end of the pyramid where it's, it's much more difficult now to, to be able to translate these new discoveries into better care in that environment where people are so hard pressed, very hard to ask them to do research on top of taking care of patients. So I would just emphasize that uh, what you heard this morning is affecting the research in emergency care as well as the, uh, as well as the patient care. Um, in response to the IOM report, the NIH uh, put together a trans-NIH emergency medical task force uh, comprised of representatives from all the 23 institutes. We're now involved in doing a targeted internal review of our research portfolios and trying to get at the key questions that are needed to be addressed to improve emergency uh, care of patients. What are the real big questions that need to be answered? Dr. Zahuni also met with the leaders of emergency medicine and, and asked them to come up with the same type of analysis. What are the big questions that need to be solved in this area uh, to improve patient care? Um, because it's very multidisciplinary, these, these problems are some of, some of which are very high level neurologic problems, heart cardiac problems. It requires coordination throughout the NIH and uh, after the NIH Reform Act, there's been a, a, a much greater emphasis on doing this kind of coordination through the Office of Portfolio Analysis and Strategic Initiatives. So I think we can come up with a trans-NIH approach to these problems that have been risen, that, that arise from our internal review and, and from discussions with the outside uh, experts. And it was mentioned before, the NIH has uh, participated with the, uh, the major group at HSS. Um, in terms of, uh, of, of just a couple of examples of what, say, com come out of our institute, the Neurologic Institute, well, lots of things that are real emergencies that need to be taken care of quickly, like stroke, status epilepticus, head injury. And uh, we have, for instance, uh, set up networks of emergency physicians to try and do trials and get new treatments in the emergency scenario out to patients quickly. Um, we have stroke uh, centers throughout the country where emergency medicine has to be a lead organization. We're trying to train emergency physicians in these centers to become uh, experts in stroke care delivery. Um, and even in the Washington area, the NIH intramural program has gone into the emergency rooms in a number of different hospitals and offered stroke and imaging expertise in the emergency setting. The NHLBI has had similar efforts with resuscitation outcomes consortium, the heart attack alert program, and NIGMS with research and training programs in trauma. So in summary, uh, I think that the NIH is very successful at coming up with new discoveries that will impact the care of emergency patients. Um, our our, our uh, bottleneck may be at this point of testing in the environment, which as you heard today is, is somewhat chaotic. And we're, we are certainly interested in working with the, uh, the department and the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness uh, response to improve delivery. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Sarbanes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Dr. Yeski, I'm, I'm interested in knowing more about this $2.7 billion of, of uh, resources that has been committed since 2002 to the to the hospital preparedness program. And I guess what's remarkable is the testimony we heard from the prior panel was pretty uniform in saying that they don't really see much evidence of, of impact from expenditures through that program. That's consistent with my own experience um, when I worked with community hospitals 
uh, post 9-11 and certainly post 2002 when these dollars became available, uh, where for the most part, you know, absent the, the occasional grant opportunity, they were not able to perceive any kind of a coordinated uh, effort to improve disaster preparedness at their level. And, and I, would, I understand the programs now within your uh, jurisdiction or, or oversight. And I wonder if you could just speak to uh, why it is that so much money has been spent on this and yet in the field uh, the, the practitioners who are on the front lines don't have a perception that it's, that it's made any kind of a measurable impact or improvement. The program in its transfer coming over uh, it needs to be enhanced in its ability to assess the impact that it's had. Uh, we, we, we know we can do a better job of, of, of assessing both the weaknesses of the, of the program thus far as well as some of the successes, and, the, and there have been some successes. The program in initially was set up to provide hospital preparedness for a, the, the bioterrorist scenarios rather than the day-to-day -day surge uh, capacities uh, issues that, that uh, we, we heard about today. But there, there have been successes. Hospitals have uh, developed uh, command and control uh, 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 systems that in, enable them to integrate better into a community's response plans with EMS, law enforcement. Uh, law enforcement. Uh, they have developed interoperable communications so they can help in a systems way route patients uh, in an event so, so they have a better way of getting the, uh, the patients to the care they need. Uh, those are just a few examples of that. I think we need to look a little bit harder at how we can improve uh, the, the, how the monies are being spent using uh, more effective uh, performance measures and being able to describe what exactly we want the hospitals to do and how to measure that. Uh, the, the, the money we give in the hospital preparedness program goes to the states. It doesn't go directly to the hospitals. It goes to the states, and then they distribute that, that money uh, to their hospitals and health care facilities rather than going to the hospitals directly. We do in this year, in this, uh, this uh, upcoming uh, uh, grant program, have a competitive piece as directed by the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act where money can go for the development of regional coalitions of hospitals, and that money will, uh, will go directly to those coalitions rather than to the state. Uh, however, those, those coalitions need to be integrated into an overall state plan. And we hear that from the states from time to time that they, they want to make sure that they understand what their coalitions are doing so it fits into the overall state preparedness. So plan. it sounds like they're, they're from the, from the get-go there needed to be more accountability as the money was being passed down the line, which um, ultimately that accountability comes back to those who are originating the, the grants and the money that's flowing. So that's, that's the federal government's responsibility if it's going to dispense $3 billion to make sure that as it's, as it's being needed out, it's being done um, in a judicious way. Let me just ask you uh, real quick where the time runs out. We heard a lot of testimony about um, what some viewed a tactical response to the emergency care uh, situation. I view perhaps as it being strategic as well, and that is to set up these regional um, networks of response to emergency care, and, and I was glad of the mention of what's been accomplished in Maryland, which I think really is a model with the MIMS uh, model and shock trauma and so forth. Uh, but I assume you see great possibilities in that approach and that m many of these dollars would be directed uh, towards trying to facilitate that kind of thinking and modeling. Is that yes, sir. We, we support the regional coalition or the regional models of uh, emergency care. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Arbanks. That's the question. In the IOM report on emergency care, the committee recommended, and I quote, the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services should conduct a study to examine the gaps and opportunities in emergency and trauma care research and recommend a strategy for the optimal organization and funding of, re of the research effort. I'm, you know, I'm very glad to learn from your testimony this morning that the Department has organized a trans-NIH emergency medicine task force. I think that's great. When can we expect the task force's recommendations? Um, my understanding is that uh, we're, we're currently in the process of doing the internal review and the fingerprinting of the research that's going on now, and that should be done uh, by the end of this year, along with the consultation with the outside groups about where they see the gaps matching up with our 
assessment, and so we think the beginning of next year we'd have the final. Now, let me tell you this, that uh, Mr. Waxman and this committee, is gonna, we're going to hold you to that. So if that, if that, when you get back to your shop and there's something different, would you let us know that? And I hope that the staff will make that a part of our questions. Because one of the things that we're trying to do is um, what we found a lot of times is we'll get answers. You know, people tell, tell us they're going to do things. The next thing you know, time passes by and it's two years later, a whole new group of congressmen, a new, whole new committee, and it sort of slips under the rug. And this is something that we cannot afford to let that happen. So we will, we're going to hold you to that. Yeah, I understand, yep. Uh, Dr. Kors, in your written testimony, you state, and I quote, the structural issues in the U.S. health care system do not fall within the peer view of the NIH. If that's true, then where should the doctors, like those on the first panel, turn for the research they need to help them improve the organization and delivery of emergency care? Well, I, I think uh, I think we, we would say that the, the that the NIH is going to be most effective at. Uh, determining what is the best therapy for a patient and actually improving what that therapy is. But the issues that you talked, that you heard about this morning are so complicated with regard to the finances, the regional organizations, uh, specialist involvement that, that that's, that, that uh, you know, going into those areas would, would really detract from our mission of, of, of make, making these therapies, you know, available. Now, I would, caveat that by saying that certainly um, we will uh, put an emphasis into bringing a therapy to market and trying to break down the bulwarks that prevent that from coming to market, but it's probably something that we need to, we can't do alone, that we need to do with uh, uh, people who are interested. The Brain Attack Coalition was, is a nice example. So we came out with a new stroke therapy, but it requires a great deal of new uh, work being done in emergency departments to deliver that therapy, and, and you heard how strained they are. We started a coalition with emergency physicians, EMS let me, providers. Let, let me ask you this. I, I'm yeah. sorry. We, we, I just want to make sure we're able to end this hearing so we don't have to hold you up for another okay. two hours or hour and a half. Let me ask you this. Would, would the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality have uh, jurisdiction over this, be helpful with this? I think that in the past that they have looked at um, delivery of health care and outcomes related to how the care is delivered. And so you, you would recommend that? I think from the standpoint of the, the, the questions about those which relate to what is the best therapy versus how it's actually proportioned, I think that, yeah, AHRQ may be more in their ballpark in terms of how and things are, how things are delivered. And you realize that AHRQ is their budget is more, more than uh, $300 million or a little more than 1 percent of your agency's budget. You know that? Yeah. Let me, let me leave you with this. Um, uh, you know, I heard you talk about getting therapies to, to I guess, to, into practice. Yeah. Uh -huh. One of the things that if we listen to the testimony today, what we heard was those therapies are nice. They're important, but they're not getting to people in many instances because people are dying. Because of the overcrowding issue. Yes. Right. And I was just sitting here thinking anybody in this room could possibly, God forbid, have a heart attack right now. And although we may have all the research, we've done our, all the things we're supposed to do, given money to NIH, done. And then, because of overcrowding, they will die. Even the gentleman, Dr. Johnson, I think it was, from one of the more affluent areas, people in his district are dying. And so it just seems to me that we can do better. And it is, it is, a, it is a shame and it's very upsetting that CMS did not appear here today. I think that that is one of the, I think that it's, when you've got close to 4,250 employees and you can't find one person and it's your responsibility to, 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 to address this issue and you don't show up, you are no-show, that's a major, major problem. And uh, 
This committee is determined to get uh, Dr. Nork here and to, to figure out what is CMS doing about this problem. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, I move that uh, we, that members have five days, five days, five days to uh, uh, submit questions and to, uh, and comments. Uh, with that, the hearing stands adjourned. Thank you very much. Democratic presidential candidate Senator Barack Obama recently announced an initiative aimed at lobbying and ethics reform on Capitol Hill. His comments tonight at 9 Eastern on C-SPAN 2.